In this video, we're going to shift gears to talk about emotion, and we're specifically going to focus on the origins of our emotion, where our emotions come from. There are many different theories of emotion in psychology. I'm going to focus on the four most prominent, and we can categorize these four different theories into two different categories of theories, and I'm going to really try and spell that out very clearly for you. So the first category of theories of emotion are known as uh, evolutionary theories of emotion. And the key idea behind evolutionary theories of emotion is that emotions precede thought, meaning emotions come before thought. So cognition is relatively unimportant in terms of evolutionary theories of emotion. And the key theory we're going to discuss for evolutionary theories of emotion is known as the discrete emotions theory. Next, we have cognitive theories of emotion, which flips the script entirely. Cognitive theories of emotion sort of assume that thoughts produce emotions. So for cognitive theories of emotion, cognition or thought is extremely important for emotion, and without cognition, you won't really get emotion. And there are three different cognitive theories of emotion that I'm going to tell you about in this video. First, we have the James Lang theory. Next, we have the Cannon Bard theory. And finally, the two factor theory. I'll go through each of these in turn, starting with the discrete emotions theory. The discrete emotions theory is an evolutionary theory of emotion, and you'll see why in a little bit, which assumes that humans experience only a small number of biologically rooted and evolutionarily useful primary emotions that are then combined in complex ways to produce the entire range of human emotion that we experience. And importantly, the discrete emotions theory assumes that emotional reactions precede thoughts, which is, again, important uh, in terms of being an evolutionary theory of emotion. So before I tell you more about the primary emotions here, I want to unpack a little bit of what's in this definition, in particular, the biologically rooted and evolutionarily useful components of this definition. First of all, biologically rooted. So you have these primary emotions, which I'll tell you more about in a second. Uh, they're biologically rooted. So the idea behind the discrete emotions theory is that these are innate. Everybody is born with these emotions and they're universal. So no matter where you're from, where you were born, what time period you're from, right? Everybody, every human uh, has and always will have this set of primary emotions. Okay. So that's the important piece. Number one. Second, the evolutionary theory that we're working with here assumes that these emotions are evolutionarily useful. That's a core part of the idea. So what does this mean, evolutionarily useful? Well, it means it helps to keep us alive. Think about an emotion like fear, which, spoiler alert, is a primary emotion according to the theory. Imagine if you're near a cliff uh, above some really scenic view, okay? If you had no fear whatsoever, well, you're probably going to go right to the edge of the cliff, look straight down, look out, because it's a beautiful view, okay? But no, that's not how we operate. We have fear, so the closer we get to the cliff, the more that our fear response says, you know what, you're in more and more danger, so we better back off. Again, that helps to keep us alive. So what are the primary emotions? Well, a variety of studies in psychology have determined that there are seven. How do they determine this? Well, they've gone out, uh, lots of people have worked on this, they've gone out to all sorts of different parts of the world, uh, different tribal communities, completely isolated from Western society with minimal language abilities, all of those sorts of things, and they've uh, tested this. So they've seen what sorts of emotions do these people experience. They've done this in a variety of ways. One very common way is to read them a story in their language that they'll understand, and that story is designed to elicit a certain type of emotion, like fear or sadness, and they basically uh, identify, do these people understand that fear is how you should respond or sadness is how uh, you should respond according to uh, the theory. So what are the different theories, uh, excuse me, uh, emotions that um, are primary emotions according to the theory? First, you have happiness. Next, you have sadness, surprise, anger, disgust, contempt, and finally, as I alluded to before, fear. <clears throat> and as I mentioned, these are primary emotions, but you can combine these primary emotions in complex ways, and I'll give you two simple examples, to produce a variety of secondary emotions. Because obviously, we as humans experience more than just seven emotions. So if you take something like hatred, this is a combination of anger and disgust targeted to an individual, uh, typically. 
If you feel alarmed, this is a combination of the primary emotions of being afraid and being surprised. Okay, so again, through these combinations, according to the theory, you get all of those other emotions that we experience. So what sort of evidence do we have for the theory? Well, a core idea is that this is universal, these emotions are universal, and that they're innate. So what we can do to start to get at that question, it's hard to prove or disprove, um, but we can look at developmental psychological studies. We can look at children, and we can see what sorts of evidence do they convey, because children have very little evidence, uh, experience excuse me, with the world, and so what sorts of emotions do they convey from a very young age? Well, even newborns seem to experience emotion because newborns spontaneously smile during REM sleep, which is typically when you might dream. And by six weeks of age, infants smile at a favorite face, for example, mom or dad's face. By three months of age, babies smile even when they're alone. This is good evidence for, uh, again, the innateness of these sorts of uh, emotions because it doesn't seem to be the case that children are just seeing that when they smile, you know, mom and dad go crazy and shower them with love and attention, okay? So it's not a sort of uh, manipulative thing they're doing. Otherwise, why would they smile when they're alone, right? Uh, there's no gain to be had from that. So it seems to be that they're just conveying the emotion sort of innately. And here's the best evidence, in my opinion. By three months of age, it's been shown that even blind babies smile when they're playing or being tickled, and they frown or cry when they're left alone. So again, this is a perfectly normal response that you would see in a non-blind baby, but it's even better evidence here because it's not something they learned, right? They've never seen their mom or dad smile or frown or cry. So it seems to be something innate, again, sort of providing some good evidence for the discrete emotions theory. So next, let's transition to the cognitive theories of emotion, starting with the James Lang theory. The James Lang theory, as I said, is a cognitive theory of emotion, which assumes that emotions result from the interpretation of our bodily reactions to stimuli. Okay, so we have a few important things here. We have emotion, we have an interpretation, we have the bodily reactions. I'm going to unpack all of that and go through a quick example. But what do I mean by bodily reactions? Well, think about if you saw a scary bear, right? You're out for a walk and you see a scary bear. What sorts of bodily reactions might you have? You might get butterflies in your stomach, your palms might begin to sweat, your heart might begin to race, it just depends. But essentially you get this fight or flight response. And so the James Lang theory says there's a stimuli out in your environment. In response to that stimuli, you get this bodily reaction, which by the way, might be different depending on which type of emotion you're experiencing, might be different depending on what the stimulus is in your environment. I'll get back to that in a little bit because that's critical. And then based on that bodily reaction, you look at that and you say, okay, my stomach's churning, my palms are sweating, I must be experiencing fear, okay? Now, it's not always that explicit, it doesn't always take that long. Sometimes it happens in the snap of a finger, just in a moment, but that's what the James Lang theory assumes. Next, we have the Cannon Bard theory. You're going to see that this theory is very similar and it has the same components, the emotion, the stimulus, the bodily reaction, all of that. But the order in which things happen, according to the Cannon Bard theory, is different than the James Lang theory assumes. The Cannon Bard theory is another cognitive theory of emotion, which assumes that physiological arousal and the emotional experience occur at the same time. They're independent of one another, but they occur at the same time. So, Again, same situation here, you, you out for a walk, uh, you see a bear, you get that bodily reaction and the emotion simultaneously, that's the Cannon Bard theory. So next we have the two-factor theory, which came along and basically said, you know what, I think these other two theories um, for cognitive theories over emotion are a little bit too simple and there's got to be a little bit more going on. So the two-factor theory assumes that there are two key factors required for emotion. So it's another cognitive theory of emotion, and you'll see the cognitive aspect of this in a moment, but it assumes that two psychological events are required for emotion. First of all, you need an undifferentiated state of physiological arousal or alertness. So this is the first way we can contrast the two-factor theory from the James Lang theory. 
The James Lang theory says, well, you know, if you see a scary bear, you might get one type of physiological response. But if you see a, a person that you're really attracted to, that's a different physiological response. And if you see, if you're, you know, I don't know, on a roller coaster, that's another, dif uh, you know, differentiated um, response. But the two-factor theory says, no, in reality, all the stuff that goes on physically on the inside, regardless of whether it's a bear, an attractive female, or a roller coaster, is all relatively similar. So it's an undifferentiated state of arousal, meaning no matter what stimulus you're responding to, uh, what's going on on the inside physically will be very similar. And this is where the second factor here comes into play. After you have that undifferentiated state of arousal, you have an appraisal step where you interpret not necessarily the arousal itself, but your external environment, your context. You're basically looking around your environment, say, okay, I know I'm in a state of arousal here. So you look around, you say, what's causing that state of arousal? Well, if there's a bear in front of you, you're going to label that arousal as fear. If you have that same arousal, but instead there's an attractive person in front of you who you're attracted to, you might label that as attraction, right? Uh, so again, undifferentiated state of arousal, and then a sort of interpretation of the context step. So what evidence do we have for the two-factor theory? I want to tell you about one classic study because it's really interesting. And there have been a lot uh, that involves sort of misinterpretation of emotion, which is a great way to uh, provide evidence for the theory. And I'll describe that in a moment. But here's what they did in this study. They had an attractive female confederate. Confederate basically means an undercover experimenter. So you don't necessarily know that she's an experimenter. You don't know what she's really doing. She's just, as far as you know, another woman out there on campus. So an attractive female confederate approaches male undergraduates and basically asks them to respond to some questions on a survey. In reality, we don't care at all about the survey. That's just a front. That's just a cover to um, give them basically her phone number. Okay. If you have follow-up questions, give me a call. Here's my phone number. That's the setup. Super simple study. But it's an experiment. 50% of the time, the female confederate approached the male undergraduates on a sturdy bridge. So that's sort of the control condition. In the experimental condition, the other 50% of the time, the female confederate approached the male undergraduates on a swaying bridge. And this is what we call the arousal condition. If you haven't been on a swaying bridge before, it's pretty intense, right? It's arousing. It definitely gets your blood pumping, okay? So we have two conditions, one in which your blood's going to be pumping, you have an undifferentiated state of arousal, sort of superficially created, and then we have a control condition in which you don't have undifferentiated state of arousal at all. So let's look at the results. The main thing they were interested in is how many of the male participants call the experimenter, which might indicate sort of romantic interest in this female confederate. On the control bridge, very few participants called the female experimenter. Okay? On the arousing bridge, when they had that undifferentiated state of arousal, they looked around, they misinterpreted their arousal as attraction to the female instead of the true cause of their arousal, which was the swaying bridge. And look how many people in the study called that female experimenter. Tons, significantly more. I will mention I left out one piece of the puzzle here, another little control. They did this with both a female interviewer, basically approaching male undergrads, and they did this with a male interviewer, male experimenter, also approaching male undergrads. All of the undergrads were, you know, heterosexual men. So if you have a male experimenter, that takes out any sort of attraction. So it reduces the odds that the participants are going to misinterpret their arousal from the swaying bridge to the male interviewer because there's no attraction there at all. Uh, and this is what they found, right? So in either condition on a control bridge or an arousing bridge, the uh, male participants were not interested in the male interviewer. So they didn't have that uh, mistake being made. So those are all of the theories of emotion, at least the main ones that we have in psychology. There are one or two uh, other ones as well, but this covers most of your ground. What I want to end the video with is just a little bit of a visualization to make the differences between these theories very clear, because there's a lot of similarities, especially between the cognitive theories of emotion, and I want to spell them out a little bit more just in one place for you. So first we have the James Lang theory. You start with an arousing stimulus. We'll go with the bear because that's the example we've gone through uh, the whole presentation with. So you start with an arousing stimulus, then you get your physiological response, which might be differentiated, could be different based on the stimulus. So in response to a bear, you might get heart racing, palms sweating, butterflies in your stomach. 
Then based on that physiological response, you infer an emotion. Okay, my heart's racing, my palms are sweating, must be fear. Next, we have the cannon bard theory. Starts in the same place, you have an arousing stimulus, but at the same time, you get the physiological response and the emotion, independently of one another. So it's not that the emotion follows the physiological response, as in the James Lang theory, they happen at the same time. And finally, you have the two-factor theory of emotion, which again starts in the same place with an arousing stimulus, and then you get those two factors, those two important components required for emotion, the physiological response, which is undifferentiated, so regardless of what's in front of you, the bear, the roller coaster, the attractive uh, person, or whatever, it's going to be similar on the inside, but then you look around and you apply a cognitive label. So you think, right? That's the cognition aspect. You look around and you think and you say, okay, I have this undifferentiated state of arousal, um, but there's an attractive person in front of me, so I must be experiencing attraction. So these two combine to form your emotion.